Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at RVA 757 Connects for our last virtual innovation spotlight for 2022. Today, the topic is uh, an exciting one to talk about uh, our mega region becoming the world's next global internet hub. Um, just wanted to quickly go over our agenda today. We're gonna talk, get, get a word from our, our sponsor, Colonial Web. We'll get an update on uh, little things that are happening here at RVA 757 Connects. Then we'll dive into our topic today. We'll leave room for some question and answers, and then we'll talk about what's coming up next in 2023. Uh, two important notes I want to make sure that you all are aware of that we are recording this session, and we will post this uh, recording to our website probably in about a week. So if you miss this or you want to share it with somebody, you go to our website, it'll be there. Also, um, during the presentation, if you have questions, use the chat function to be able to, to chat to me, to ask your questions, and we'll leave time, as I said, at the very end for some, some questions and answers. So I wanna um, thank, thank our sponsor today, Colonial Web. You know, RBA 757 Connects is a nonprofit organization. So we rely on our donations to, for our operations. And one of our, cor our corporate sponsors is Colonial Web Contractors. They're one of the largest mechanical electrical contractors in the region. And we have with us today, Nathan Weddington, who is Colonial Web's Vice President for the Michigan uh, Critical Division of Colonial Web, where he leads the company's pursuit and execution of mission critical project work. Nathan has worked for more than 12 years in the commercial construction industry. He began his career with Colonial Web uh, in the construction division as a project engineer and a pre-construction engineer. He has a bachelor's degree in science and, and, and bachelor's of science degree in mechanical engineering and business from the University of Virginia, where he graduated with highest distinction. Uh, Nathan, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Greg, for the uh, introduction. And thank you to the entire 757 or RVA 757 Connects team um, for their continued effort in supporting the growth and development of the Richmond Tidewater region. You know, it's not lost on all of us that this group connects, I believe, more than 60 leaders from 10 different industries to create this strategic plan. So I can speak for all businesses operating within this region when I say that we are grateful for the amazing folks who have come together to support this mission. Um, as Greg referenced, my name is Nathan Weddington. I'm the vice president of our mission critical group here at Colonial Web, where we focus on the construction and service of the largest and most complex data and operations center facilities within the state of Virginia. With that in mind, the subject at hand of this webinar of the um, Global Internet Hub developing before our very eyes here in the Richmond Tidewater region is near and dear to my business specifically. So very happy to support, very happy to listen in. Wanted to take a quick couple minutes to share a little bit about Colonial Web, who we are, what we do, and then also connect um, how the global internet hub development in our region has greatly impacted our business and the local community we connect with. So Colonial Web is privileged to have celebrated our 50th anniversary this year. Um, and with around a thousand employees all over the Mid-Atlantic, we feel privileged to call Virginia our home. Our corporate office is in Henrico, Virginia. However, we have offices in Charlottesville, Chesapeake, Chantilly, Newport News, Baltimore, and Harrisonburg. As I mentioned, we employ around 1,000 teammates consisting primarily of trade skilled individuals, people like welders, HVAC and refrigeration mechanics, plumbers and pipe fitters, electricians, engineers, project managers, office support professionals, and virtual design professionals. Um, in 2010, we became part of the Comfort Systems USA Network, which is a nationwide provider of building system installation and maintenance, with more than 42 operating companies in over 140 locations across the United States, also employing over 15,000 people. At Colonial Web, we help engineer, design, and construct the mechanical electrical plumbing systems to meet the needs of today's most technically complex facilities. In doing so, we perform a wide range of services, including mechanical, electrical, process piping, modular construction, and building automation systems. The markets that our groups uh, focus on primarily consist of data, things like data centers, healthcare facilities, education facilities, industrial facilities, 
manufacturing, laboratories, food processing, cold storage, along with many, many others. We've been extremely privileged to work on projects like the 2.5 million square foot, multi-billion dollar Facebook Meta data center facility in Sanson, Virginia, along with the 1.4 million square foot QTS data center here in Richmond, which happens to be the home of the Richmond uh, network access point as well. Um, Colonial Web, we recognize the development of the Global Internet Hub coming in the area um, quite a few years ago and kind of reorganized our business to show commitment to that mega region and those efforts. We, along with many others on this call, um, recognize that the I-64 Innovation Corridor is well positioned for success in this effort. Um, given its access to inexpensive and reliable power, thanks Dominion, um, sustainable energy, fiber, and then along with a tremendous workforce. This development allowed us to create a dedicated group of over 300 people and growing, whose primary focus is on the construction and service of the most significant uptime mission critical facilities in this region, directly supporting the efforts to create a world-class internet hub here in the RBA 757 mega region. Um, the impact of the global internet hub in our region has been tremendously impactful for our business and all those teammates we employ. We're committed to the growth and development of this global internet hub and the mega region holistically. I can personally honestly say from my career perspective, I would not be where I'm at without the growth in this region. And I know I can speak for many others who feel the same way. There's a ton more I'd love to discuss, um, but I know I promised I'd only take two minutes. Um, if anyone would like to reach out to discuss further, or if Colonial Web can help with any of your mechanical electrical plumbing system needs for your facilities, um, on the screen is my contact information. Please feel free to contact me at any time. Um, and yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts, and I hope everyone enjoys the webinar at hand. Hey, thank you so much, Nathan. That was uh, interesting. I didn't realize that Colonial Web, until we, you know, I chatted the other day, uh, was responsible for working on the uh, the Meta slash Facebook data center out there in Eastern and Riker County. So fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for your insights and for sponsoring this webinar. Thank you. So, so let me uh, update everybody briefly on what's happening with RBA 757 Connects. You know, we're an organization that likes to talk about convening and connecting and collaborating uh, to improve the economic success of everyone in the RVA and uh, 757 regions. So we identify a bunch of, of, of initiatives that we are focusing on. And one of them was to advocate or is to advocate for the widening of Interstate 64, that 29 mile gap from between Richmond and Williamsburg. Um, and the good news is that uh, it's happening, um, that uh, next week, it's going to be a, uh, a public hearing out in uh, New Kent County to talk about the design and construction uh, schedule for the first phase of a three-part phase of that 29-mile gap area. If you're interested in going, you can go there. There's the information. Uh, just to update everybody, just so you remember, you know, up until uh, this year, uh, Interstate 64 between the Bottoms Bridge exit and uh, the Williamsburg area was that 29 miles was two lanes. And we were advocating to make that three lanes in both directions. Uh, it was gonna cost $750 million. It really wasn't much, there wasn't any, anything in the budget. Well, the good news is that uh, the General Assembly uh, put $470 million in the budget. The governor signed that. Uh, the Central Virginia Transit Authority put in a, another $100 million. They're planning on a commitment there. Uh, VDOT has, has uh, applied for a federal grant for another $150 million, which we expect to hear sometime this month. So uh, all in all, we've got the funds uh, for the project and things are happening. So um, Interstate 64 widening uh, between the Richmond region and uh, the Williamsburg area, a 29 mile gap in a couple of years should be completed. Another initiative, one of our other initiatives is to accelerate the uh, internet Global internet, global internet Hub as a, uh, a status here in the I-64 Innovation Corridor. But what exactly is an Internet Hub? Um, the best way to un understand global Internet Hubs is to see them on a concentrated hotspots uh, or nodes on a world map of the Internet. And internet Hubs are physical locations where carrier net networks, content um, delivery networks, 
social network, cloud services, hosting, gaming, IT services providers, all choose to locate, co-locate, and internet connect, usually in a massive data center, and typically called an, an internet exchange point um, or within several data centers in the same metropolitan region. Today, you know, most cities have some type of internet uh, exchange locations, making them regional uh, internet hubs. But the super, the super large hubs, especially the ones that are served by subsea cables, become known and are officially designated as global internet hubs. As you can see, the top 10 here in the, in the world, two of them are in the United States, Miami and Los Angeles. And there are a lot of characteristics that we have discovered um, of, of global internet hubs. You know, not only do they have these of subsea cables, but they have growing data centers in the area. They have um, access to inexpensive electricity. Uh, the, the land is inexpensive for data centers. Uh, they have tech savvy workforce. Uh, and then they also have enlightened leaders among other things. So what does this all mean for the mega region to become a global internet hub? Well, you know, uh, technology is rapidly growing and changing. For, for 50 years, processing power uh, improved linearly, and soon it will, it will improve exponentially. Internet traffic has increased five times in the past five years, and 90% of all data that exists today has been created in the last two years or so. so. There's a lot of different advantages to having Internet Hub, Global Internet Hub access. Um, one is having faster and more reliable service. Uh, and it provides you know, competitive advantage to conduct business for all speeds of light. Um, it attracts a larger tech talent. It supports the 21st century uh, business model. Then there's community advantages. You know, the localities where these data centers are located, for instance, um, they get a surge of tax revenue because of them. Um, it also in increases the high-speed internet and it, it improves healthcare access because they can all, all talk to, you know, the various hospitals and doctor's offices can talk to one another. Um, and it serves underserved neighborhoods. And it also helps, you know, improve and enhance location appeal for remote work. Um, and and, and it, uh, there's also something called future-proofing of a community, which means the next generation of technology is being added and, and, and hey, being in a global internet hub uh, arena will be able to uh, enable us to be able to be leading in that, in that arena. There's also the idea that these uh, global internet hubs are attracting a growing level of business interest and investment. These hotspots attract companies that want to locate near the fastest and most reliable internet service. This in turn attracts tech talent and the success just feeds off of the continuous growth. Um, regions that understand this economic development model do everything possible to accelerate the growth of their digital infrastructure to enable growing faster through the hyper collaboration and intentional support. So we're on our way to becoming a global internet hub. Our journey started uh, uh, 10 years ago in 2012, uh, Hurricane Sandy caused so much destruction to the New York coastline that it prompted development of a third uh, East Coast landing site. In 2016, Virginia Beach was chosen uh, for that uh, landing site. And today there are three uh, subsea cables that are now uh, um, in use in Virginia Beach. A fourth, so two of them are coming from Europe, one from Spain, one from France. There's the third one coming from uh, South America. And a fourth one is planned, uh, the South Atlantic Express, to be available to, uh, to, uh, to be available to, to Africa. We've also got the confluence cables. They're now going to mirror the East Coast of the United States, going from New Jersey to Virginia Beach, having landing sites in, in Myrtle Beach, Jacksonville, and Miami. And Virginia Beach has four more permitted uh, air, four more uh, possibilities for cables to come up, uh, ashore in the Virginia Beach area. Um, and Virginia Beach also has major companies that are locating there. Globalnix, for instance, um, has a subsea carry neutral interconnection. Telexis is one of the largest uh, providers of the subsea cables, and they own and operate two of those cables that are coming ashore. 
Uh, more data centers possibly in the future in the Virginia Beach area. Virginia Beach is working with the Naval, uh, Naval Air Station Oceana to put about 1,000 acres of its property into the public stream for potential development for data centers. In that area, they're enhancing the terrestrial network. Uh, plans are underway right now and construction is, should be starting soon on the Hampton Roads network ring. This is a 119 mile fiber optic ring that will connect uh, five Southampton Roads localities and eventually will go over in a second phase over to the peninsula. Up in the Richmond area, we've got a major digital infrastructure tech park in the White Oak Technology Park in Eastern Henrico County, where you've got you know, Meta there, you've got QTS, Bank of America has a, a data center there, HP has operations there. Um, the Facebook data center uh, is 2.5 million square feet. It just is now completing uh, its a, an expansion that it started uh, several years ago, and it should be ready sometime in early 2023. Next door is QTS, and QTS is a 1.4 million square foot uh, data center. It's the world's fourth largest, and they're doubling the size of it by adding another 1.5 million square feet to the uh, data center there. And then we've got DSIC. This is another major milestone for us uh, with the location of the DSIC uh, Data Central neutral, neutral Internet Exchange Point. Um, as you can see, there are five locations in the country that have these internet connection points, Phoenix, Dallas, Chicago, New York, big cities, and Richmond, Virginia. So that brings us to today's topic, uh, becoming the world's next global internet hub. We've got some great um, and, and very in, insightful uh, uh, consultants that are working with us to talk about uh, this, uh, the, uh, in a, in the Global Internet Hub and what it all means. Uh, Jonathan uh, Hembo is the Senior Research Manager for Telegeography. That's a telecommunications market research company. He joined the firm in 2009 and heads the company's data center research, tracking capacity development, and pricing trends in the key markets. And then we also have Vinay Nagpal. He's president of Interglobix. That's the global consultancy and advisory firm focused on the convergence of data centers, terrestrial and subsea fibers, and as part of the digital, digital infrastructure industry. He is a data center and connectivity leader and a visionary who has 27 years of experience developing products and technology solutions. So just as a reminder, again, we, uh, we will be taking questions towards the end, but if you have any questions, use the chat functions. Now I'm going to turn this, the program over to Vinay to, to begin his presentation. Vinay? Thank you so much, Greg. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for your time today. Happy to continue our collaboration uh, with the uh, mega region, per se, and all of you, and really glad to be participating in the discussion today. What I'd like to do is give you a quick overview about Interglobix. Uh, and to talk about some of the macro trends in terms of what's happening around us. I literally just returned a few hours back from uh, Singapore where I was for a conference and met with uh, John's uh, peer um, from telegeography there as well and a few other folks from the industry. I'm going to talk about them. But really, if we look at, um, let's move on to the next slide to give for those of you not familiar, you know, in terms of from a, from a corporate standpoint, uh, uh, Greg, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Are you able to drive the slides? Yeah, so as, as Greg mentioned, you know, our firm is focused on providing global solutions uh, for the convergence of data center, subsea, and uh, terrestrial fiber. We work with various different uh, firms uh, around the world uh, focused on uh, work which is related to product management, uh, market strategy, uh, development due diligence, uh, data center outsourcing, and and really landing of subsea cables in in specific data centers around the world, uh, and our and our team is spread across uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, we also have a global publication where we uh, focus on data center and connectivity services. Uh, it's a quarterly publication. Uh, our company has been uh, soon; it'll be five years for our company to be around, and we've worked with multiple uh, multiple regions around the world. And in the next slide uh, kind of demonstrates some of our industry affiliations where we've got uh, 
uh, in engagement with a lot of different uh, organizations uh, around the world who we work with very closely. DKIX is one Greg touched on, and I'll be talking about more in my presentation, which is a data center carrier neutral uh, leading internet exchange point, which is in our region now. Um, if you look at some of the trends in terms of what's happening around us, uh, Greg, if we move on to the next section, uh, what we are noticing is that you know we are constantly generating more data, which means that we need to have ability to save, uh, store, and access that data. It's pretty simple in terms of you know if we if we think about what's happening around us. Now, having said that, the amount of data generated is absolutely incredible. If you look at uh, some of the statistics, it's uh, five two point five quintillion bytes of data created, which is one one quintillion is about 1 million terabytes or 1 billion gigabytes. And that's roughly around 700 terabytes of data per minute that's generated. So right now I'm uh, projecting, uh, you know, connected from my laptop. Generally speaking, our laptops have one terabyte of data. So per minute you have 700 such laptops worth of data created. And also it's important to keep in mind that this data that's created is being stored somewhere at a, at a very fundamental level. That's where the data centers come into play where the data is stored in a secure, safe and highly, collect, uh, highly connected manner. Um, when we look at internet of things, when we look at smart cities, when we look at uh, health, e-health and what have you, right? What that leads to is more and more connected devices. Uh, I mean, you know, if you look at pure numbers from 2018 uh, or the next 12 years to 2030, uh, we're going to more than double the number of dev connected devices globally, which is from 22 billion to 50 billion. And what that really means is just if you think about connected cars, if you think about smart homes, any device that's connected to the internet needs to access that data in a very scalable, highly connected way. And that's where the data centers come into play from a you know secure saving of data perspective, and then all the access that's happening to uh, access that data in a seamless way. Data consumption uh, of these devices is also uh, is also growing rapidly, as you can see from uh, the numbers here. 2018 was roughly around 33 zettabytes of data consumed, uh, uh, increasing all the way to around 150 zettabytes by over the next couple of years by 2024. And what that is leading to is more and more data centers that's that are around us. Uh, Nathan mentioned, uh, Nathan talked about in, in his introductory remarks about the QTS facility. Uh, there's the meta data center, which is also classified as a hyperscale data center. Uh, and then you have third party data centers, uh, you know, by companies like, by QTS, like uh, Digital Realty and others. And over the next year or so, the data center industry globally is going to be roughly around $174 billion industry. And subsea cables have played a big role from a hyperscaler perspective where hyperscalers are investing in the data centers and in subsea cables hand in hand. And I'll talk more about that in the coming slide. Moving on to the next slide, Greg, um, you know, you hear a lot about edge these days. You hear about cloud computing. At the end of the day, the whole uh, premise is to get data closer to the end user. And in that, in that path of a, of, of, of a packet where you have it going from a source to a destination, you know, you have cell towers, you have access networks, you have data centers along the way. And there's more and more emphasis on edge data centers. Why? Because you need faster, quick access to data. So data is deployed in a more scalable way to the edge. And that's where you have, you know, some of these newer applications, like you hear a lot about the new 5G rollouts that are happening by mobile operators, connected cars, autonomous cars, drones, starting to our Amazon packages, e-health I talked about earlier, all of those rely on accessing the data in a, in, a, in a fast way. That's where the edge computing really comes to play. And cloud computing as a phenomena has been around for a while. It's primarily a providing compute in a scalable way. Again, all related to data centers and connectivity services that kind of uh, make it all happen. The next slide demonstrates the importance of digital infrastructure. When I talk about digital infrastructure that combines data centers, macro towers, small cell towers, fiber optic cables, like terrestrial cables like this one, which is uh, in my hand right now, you can see 6,912 strands 
of, uh, of terrestrial fiber cables. You have subsea cables, which is uh, you know similar to the cable I'm holding in my hand now. That's this is a 16 uh, a fiber strand cable. So all of these infrastructure kind of combines together into uh, the next slide, please, Greg, into what's part of the digital infrastructure. And ultimately it's all connected together. And this digital infrastructure is what's driving digital transformation. When you hear about digital transformation, regardless of the industry, whether it's healthcare, whether it's agriculture, whether it's um, whether it's uh, whether it's banking, whether it's uh, automobile industry, at the end of the day, people talk about digital infrastructure being the fourth utility. Digital infrastructure is what's driving that digital transformation across all industry, and that's the that's the important uh, theme here. We recently held a, a summit, a global summit. Uh, uh, you know, by the Internet Ecosystem Innovation Committee, Bank of America, amongst others, was one of the key participants there. And they are talking about how the how the banking industry is relying on this digital infrastructure to run their business. And the Bank of America CEO has publicly said they're no longer a bank; they're a technology company. Their reliance on di digital infrastructure is key to their business, and that's going to continue to happen more and more. Moving on to the next slide. So what's happening is that if you look at the economic impact, according to the World Economic Forum, the combined value economic impact to the society and the industry of digital transformation that's happening could be greater than $100 trillion over the next 10 years. If you think about it, that's where, because when you're, when you're, when you're using this infrastructure across all possible industries, then that ultimately makes a phenomenal impact uh, at a macro level. Moving on to the next slide, looking at some of the some of the key uh, trends that are happening. Right, data centers are the engines of digital economy. I mentioned earlier because at the end of the day, whether it's a third-party operated data center, whether it's a hyperscale data center, whether it's a retail co-location data center, you need to have that data highly secure, highly available, highly reliable place. Uh, and what's happening in the global data center industry? Uh, if you look at the power consumption. Um, which is roughly around 3% of the world's electricity uh, is consumed by data center as of 2019. Uh, and it's expected to grow by 12% by 2030. There's a, yes, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, being carbon, not only neutral, but carbon negative these days. So carbon neutral is you have net zero carbon dioxide emissions and being carbon negative, you are basically sending clean energy back to the grid. So you're reducing your carbon footprint to less than being neutral. And that's happening in multiple dimensions across the industry. If you look at some of the macro trends, uh, the European Union da data centers across the board are gonna be carbon, fully carbon neutral by 2030. Dominion Energy in our region has a couple of major projects underway and they have their own goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. And also we are starting to see now uh, data centers are starting to go vertical. They're going multiple floors. That's been very prevalent in Asia anyways, where land is scarce, but we're starting to see that in our region as well. Moving on to the next slide, a lot of new money has been brought into this sector, you know, from a private equity firm perspective. As an example, if you, even if you look at QTS, which is very prevalent in our region, uh, uh, we talked about the NAP earlier as a network access point, but QTS is now part of Blackstone, Blackstone acquired them for $10 billion. And as part of that, you're seeing a lot of uh, land banking happening in different parts uh, of the country and, and, and soon in other parts of the world as well. That's pretty much been the trend across the board if you look at other major data center providers. And, and we will see a lot more development happening. My previous company, by the way, was DuPont Fabros Technology, which got acquired by Digital Realty. We got, a, we got a 22X multiple at the time on our EBITDA, and we're seeing that increase uh, over the last several years in terms of you know, the multiple that's paid for data center companies by these private equity firms. Moving on to the next slide, when we look at subsea cables in particular, um, Greg already talked about you know, that from a data growth perspective, 99% of the data is generated over the last two years or so, but 99.7%, again, 99.7% of all data internationally is traversing through these subsea cables. So they are the lifeblood of the digital economy, if you ask me. And with the resurgence, what's happening is, 
And uh, over the last, uh, from 2016 to 2020, there's been a roughly around $14 billion of value creation happened over 107 new cables. Over the last couple of years, uh, from 2021 to 2023, another $8 billion in new development and more than $10 trillion worth of transactions are happening every day. And I mentioned earlier that hyperscalers are continuing to uh, invest very heavily into these subsea cables because at the end of the day, these cables are connecting different continents together, connecting the countries together and traversing the data from point A to point B. And there are more than 530 cables spread across 1,000 to 245 plus cable landing stations. And I'm sure John would have much more uh, you know, uh, current data on those cables and landing stations because telegeography tracks those. Moving on to the next uh, section here. So what our firm is doing as part of the Global Internet Hub project, we've been very actively involved with RVS 757 since the very beginning. John and I connected early on, and I, again, I've said it uh, consistently to John to bring together you know, multiple parties from across across the region, um, from both from a public private sector perspective is very commendable. So we've kind of collaborated, you know, participated in several um, webinars. We did the white paper, uh, you know, our, we've kind of, I reviewed it, provided feedback. So it's an ongoing partnership we have moving on to the next slide. I think one thing if I want to highlight is that when we did the webinar, uh, which was, I think, uh, and towards the end of October, John, if I remember correctly, last year, we had uh, a couple of international guests from Marseille, which is known globally as a role model for data center subsea convergence, driving economic growth. So we had we had uh, representation from both public and private sector, from Port of Marseille, from Interaction, which is a data center company, and that sort of brought out you know the importance of. Uh, intentionality where they kind of made a pragmatic approach with that partnership to drive more economic growth in the region, to drive more digital infrastructure. And what that has led to showing in the next slide here, Greg, is that the, the subsea cable, this has happened very rapidly, as you can see from 2014 to 2021, uh, in, a, in a span of seven years. And yes, seven years is a very short amount of time. If you look at the amount of growth that's happened, Purely from the perspective of, you know, going from 11 to 14 subsea cables, the amount of traffic that's traversing has more than doubled from 90 terabits per second to 220. And if you look at the projection over the next couple of years, this is happening as we speak in terms of the number of subsea cables in Marseille to, to get to 21 with over 200 networks present there and six internet exchange points. So having that neut neutral approach goes a very, very long way. And we had some very interesting uh, sessions as a result of that uh, uh, webinar we had and discussions there, thereafter. Moving on, uh, Greg, to the next section. So what we are doing now as part of this project is uh, we are very much uh, involved in a qualitative interviewing of leaders of interconnection hubs around the world and really kind of feeding that information to the overall uh, process. And this is John and Greg's slide. Uh, which I'm using here to kind of demonstrate where Inaglobics comes into play from a from a specific engagement perspective. Moving on to the next slide. So what what we have done is uh, you know set up uh, quantitative, um, um, qualitative interviews with industry leaders. We've actually already started that process uh, when we've looked at esta established interconnection hubs and emerging interconnection hubs. Uh, and and in a nutshell, you know what's established is that there's a significant amount of traffic traversing. We have significant networks that are already there at a particular location. But I think it was important for us to also look at some up and coming interconnection hubs, which may have some similarities with what's happening in our mega region. Uh, and then as part of that process, additional research includes looking at industry sources, media publication, uh, other articles that are there to kind of address the questions that John and Greg have very articulately collated the questions that are posed by the steering committee. So as part of this engagement, we'll try to have those questions answered to the best uh, best uh, of our ability. And of course, uh, you know, Telegeography is a very well reputed firm. I have personally had the privilege of working with Telegeography over the last 25 plus years uh, through various companies that I've been part of. And John and I have been kind of, uh, you know, we've kept in touch and of course now 
we are uh, code, we are we have we, we have been in sync with this uh, project as well moving on um, greg here basically our selection criteria has been centered around convergence of data centers and subsea where this infrastructure is driving regional growth to a particular region and of course there is a lot of emphasis on diversity so we're looking at uh, the imminent international connectivity pathways intentionality is key as i mentioned in case of marseille and other location where you are seeing that specific uh, projects are being led in particular regions for that particular uh, for that particular theme in mind of data center subsea convergence. Moving on to the next slide, um, some of the regions which we have classified as emerging include Barcelona in Spain, Esberg in Denmark, Crete in Greece, Mumbai in India. And there's some specific characteristics of these which uh, you know they're they're available on these slides, but I want to make sure I'm saving enough time for John to go over over, over uh, you know his uh, part of the presentation as well. well. Let's move on to the next slide, Greg. Continuing that list for uh, the interconnection hubs that we are evaluating include Fortaleza in Brazil, uh, Lisbon, or and signs the the entire region uh, in Portugal, which is up and coming as well in Guam, which is becoming a major gaming hub and a gateway for um, for Asia and Australia from the US. Uh, and some of the existing established hubs which are there, uh, Greg, if you move on to the next slide, please, that we're evaluating includes Stockholm in Sweden, Hong Kong, uh, and Marseille. Of course, we've talked about Marseille and uh, both Hong Kong and Sweden uh, and, and Stockholm uh, have some very peculiar characteristics which we will be highlighting in our report. Thank you very much. Well, wow, Vinay, that was a uh, fascinating, interesting uh, stuff, and and I, I love the prop that you had. That was great. I, I'd love to be able to see that. Now we'll switch it over to Jonathan. Jonathan, uh, we're going to turn it over to you to give us uh, insight from your perspective. All right. Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, so I want to give just in our, our brief time together an overview of who we are at Telegeography. What we track in terms of international network development, and I'm going to focus on a couple of really specific metrics that are pertinent to the project that we're working on together with uh, Interglobix and the steering committee on this uh, I-64 innovation corridor uh, strategic plan. So uh, with that in mind, let's just start with a brief overview of who we are. Telegeography has been around since 1989, about 33 years, uh, and as the name uh, indicates we map the geography of global telecom network development. We focus on themes of capacity development, uh, constraint route development, um, market dynamics, and, uh, and pricing within markets around the world. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, various products related to uh, these themes. Um, looking at underlying transport network infrastructure, subsea cables uh, are really one of the core areas that we track, uh, along with international voice, internet, content network development, um, and uh, enterprise network development as well, increasingly. So uh, our customer base tends to consist of a, a wide variety of uh, players who are interested in, in global uh, you know, investment and in, in international infrastructure. So if you go on to the next slide, um, I want to talk specifically about several of the metrics that are very pertinent to the project at hand um, and, and explain what each of these, uh, the, the, the impact of each of these two to global network development. Um, we're going to look at international internet bandwidth, what that is and what it means for uh, network interconnection and development. Uh, we're going to take a, a look, a brief look at the data center environment, what, what local uh, network e uh, ecosystems mean to, to network growth, internet exchanges and cloud infrastructure as well. So let's go on to the next. All right, so this is a depiction of uh, our our uh, interactive map on global internet hubs. So when you look at this, this is depicting both aggregate um, international internet bandwidth within these markets, as well as aggregate route uh, capacity between hubs. And there's a lot that get, that uh, that you can kind of tell from from this depiction. Um, for one thing, 
global global networks are an intermeshed uh, um, interconnection of, of of various locations that showing the level of interdependence that networks have on each other across the globe so the biggest hubs in the world are tightly intermeshed with each other but they're also the hubs from which other uh, parts of the globe are dependent for their international uh, internet uh, connectivity um, the, the internet is not just something that happens out of the blue, um, that, that it comes to the end user from, um, from, one, from one network provider. Your network provider is interconnected with other network providers and they, they are interconnected via uh, a labyrinth of routes across the world. And, uh, and really when we talk about the, the internet superhighway, the network superhighways, um, these are the aggregate uh, um, routes through which networks um, pass along their traffic from major destination to ma major destination and disaggregate to their end uh, users. So the largest internet uh, hubs in the world, uh, many of them are in Europe. Uh, if you look at the flat markets, just because of the proximity between nations, the flat markets are uh, by far the, the largest markets with the exception also of Singapore. Uh, each of those markets has at least 100 terabits of connected international internet capacity. So, um, but, but that said, um, if you look at that, that um, large line going across the Atlantic there, the, the, uh, the UK to US route is still one of the very largest um, nation to nation internet routes in the world, showing that that intercontinental connectivity is absolutely critical as well. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so the data centers component is also incredibly key to all of this. So when we think about the geography of telecom networks, it's network to network interconnection, location to location interconnection, but the ultimate connectivity happens within physical buildings. And these are the data centers. So when we track data center development, it's tightly interlinked with what we're tracking on the network side as well. And so the, the, these two facets go very much hand in hand. Uh, where you see major internet development, you also see significant data center development always. Um, and by our, our measure, the largest data center markets in the world predictably are among the largest network environments and the largest commercial hubs in the world. Uh, Tokyo is a bit outsized here when we look at a retail um, co-location growth, which is, um, uh, shared data center space. And that's because of the outsized influence of NTT within that market. But if you look at these other markets, um, uh, the, the Washington region, which is really Northern Virginia for the most part, uh, is one of the absolute largest markets. And, the, and then several others are right behind it and with very similar levels of retail capacity development. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, what happens within these data centers, though? So you have um, you have network to network interconnection, um, an aggregate connection across vast distances. You have data centers where these networks interconnect, but the but you have to tunnel down deeper to see the the level of activity, the level of health within a given market. And uh, this is just showing an example of a of an individual data center site um, that's that's featured in our database of more than 4,000 sites, um, showing a, a Kio site in, in Querétaro, Mexico. And what you see here, if you look at that ecosystem pie chart, is the diversity of connection happening within just that one facility. And the, the number of networks that one can connect to uh, listed there on the right um, shows that uh, there's, there's a diversity of both CDNs, local networks, global networks uh, across the board. And this gives a sense of the kind of, uh, the kind of activity happening within an individual data center. And we have, um, uh, we have hundreds of sites that have this level of activity or even more. Um, and so that, the, looking at the local ecosystem within the data center and across data centers when within a market gives you a sense of what's happening in any given location. Let's go to the next slide. I love uh, looking at internet exchanges because there's hardly a better window for what's happening within a local market. So 
An internet exchange is uh, basically a, a fabric that enables networks to expedite peering with each other. So when, a, when networks are members of an exchange, they're able to interconnect with each other faster than they would on their own. Internet exchanges typically, with a couple of really glaring exceptions, uh, share a tremendously rich amount of data. And uh, what you have here is an example from DKIX's website showing the, the number of uh, ASNs, that's individual networks, connected to the exchange, um, IP routes, a listing of who the, the members are. And uh, on the left there, you, or in the middle of the, of the slide, you see a depiction of the traffic levels uh, within that market. Um, internet exchanges almost universally uh, share this kind of data. So when you look at the traffic levels and the number of members connected, you get a really strong indication of the amount of activity happening within any given market. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, another, another measure that we track very closely at telegeography is cloud infrastructure. So looking beyond just how networks are interconnecting with each other to share internet traffic, uh, it's also really critical to see where cloud providers are located. And this provides a really strong early or, 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 or major indicator of the level of activity within a given market. Um, because cloud provisioning within a local market uh, provides uh, the, the, the optimal access for, for enterprise applications that, that many companies need uh, access, that most companies need access to uh, with as low latency as possible. So there are two ways to, two major ways to really track this. One is by looking at on-ramp locations, which is uh, individual footprints where a cloud provider will have a co-location footprint in a local and one or more data centers locally where networks can peer with them and have expedited, dedicated access to that cloud provider's application somewhere else. That provides a very early indicator of how uh, critical that market is to that cloud provider's business. But even more critical is whether or not that cloud provider decides to ultimately set up a full-blown cloud region within that local market. At that point, what we see is uh, an investment in uh, redundant data centers within the local market, providing absolutely optimal access to those applications uh, in that locale. So this provides one of the greatest indications of the level of activity uh, and the, the level of importance of a local market to, uh, to enterprise connectivity for cloud applications. Let's go into the next. So uh, with those in mind, keep uh, look, thinking about the kinds of things that we track, uh, those are specifically some of the biggest indicators that we're gonna be tracking for the strategic committee's plan. Um, and so uh, a bit more about what we're gonna be doing with the plan. Uh, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna provide a, a study of uh, 10 markets um, and similar to what Vinay has just talked about, we're going to, we're going to highlight 10 specific markets, a couple of major hubs just for comparison to show what a full rich uh, um, um, established interconnection environment looks like. But we're going to really highlight a number of uh, up and coming or, or uh, strong regional hubs uh, to show um, what um, what the RVA region could, uh, could become or is already becoming uh, in some ways. The list that we're going to be um, that we're going to be focusing on is slightly different than what Vinay is is doing, but uh, quite similar. We're very much on the same page in terms of what we're tr we're tracking, but for us, we're going to focus on markets where we have uh, 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 quantitative data to support what's happening, and in some cases, Vinay is going to be focused focusing more qualitatively on markets that have similarities in terms of where they're where they're moving but um, we don't have sufficient data yet to, to support fully. Um, we're also gonna be providing an assessment of the submarine cable market on the East Coast in the US in support of this, since that's such a critical component of what's happening in Virginia Beach and how that interconnects with the rest of the I-64 corridor. Uh, let's go to the next. So as far as the major hubs that we're gonna track, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Hong Kong and of course Marseille being 
uh, the, the absolute gold standard in terms of what other markets are trying to uh, emulate in terms of their development. Um, both of these are major intercontinental gateways uh, with a lot of uh, uh, con subsea convergence combined with a strong local data center ecosystems. Um, go on to the next, please, Greg. In terms of what we're going to be tracking with up and coming hubs or dynamic regional hubs, as I'm calling them, in some cases, I think fully developed, but on a smaller scale than really some of the biggest hubs. Um, are, are looking at the positioning along broader international routes, for one, we want to look at places that uh, could capture a degree of demand going from um, broader points, um, A and B, um, much like Marseille has captured a lot of demand coming from Middle East, Africa, Asia, that would otherwise go further up and backhaul to Frankfurt or Paris. Um, Certainly Virginia Beach and Richmond are in a position to capture some a, a lot more of the demand that would be otherwise coming uh, from South America or Europe going onward to Ashburn. So we're going to look at markets that have a similar development pattern in that regard. We're going to look at markets that are uh, that are close to much bigger markets. That's a very key consideration I think for the for the I64 corridor because uh, in your case, um, uh, you're 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 close to one of the biggest markets in the world, which is Ashburn, of course. And so we're going to look at some markets that um, are developing, um, despite the fact that there's incredibly low latency between them and much larger markets. Uh, we're going to look at the the strength of the interconnection indicators that we've just talked about as well. So with that said, let's just briefly look at some of the markets that we're going to cover. Um, as, uh, as uh, Vinay is going to do as well, we're going to cover um, Mumbai, Lisbon, and Barcelona. Um, these are all subsea gateways, um, some of which are uh, further along than others. Mumbai is um, growing very rapidly right now. Uh, Lisbon uh, and Barcelona are a little bit more of a nascent stage, but in well positioned to, to see growth given their positioning uh, in intercontinental uh, uh, network um, convergence. Let's move on to the next. I want to focus on a few other locations as well that um, that aren't necessarily subsea gateways, but or, or, or aren't at all, but but have some really intriguing indicators that I think would be useful for uh, your region. Um, Sofia Bulgaria has uh, interested me for a long time. Um, because it's really at a at a converging point between continents, even though it's more of a terrestrial gateway, we see a tremendous amount of peering traffic through multiple IXs within uh, that community. So uh, I think that's going to be a useful case study for for the region. Um, perhaps even more relevant, and really one of one of the ones I'm most excited about delving into is uh, looking at Malaysia, due to its proximity to Sim uh, to Singapore. Uh, much like uh, the situation in Virginia right now, um, there's, there is a hindrance to new development in Singapore due to sustainability concerns. And, uh, and at the same time, we still see a lot of demand in that market for interconnection and a lot more subsea cables in the pipeline coming in. So a lot of the demand that would otherwise go into uh, expanding data center presence within, within Singapore has to go somewhere. And in this case, uh, it's highly likely and already already proving to be the case that a lot of this development is going to um, spill over into Malaysia. Uh, we just had an, uh, an, um, uh, uh, an announcement from Equinix this past week that they are going to be building in Johor Bahru right across the channel there from, Mal uh, from uh, Singapore. And uh, we've had a number of other announcements similar to this in the, in the last year or so. Uh, so I think that's going to be a really interesting case study. Uh, I've got Ham Hamburg and uh, Manchester on, on the list as well. Um, both of these are a strong secondary enterprise-driven markets within their respective nations. And I think that uh, given the health of their interconnection uh, ecosystems, they're going to be really useful case studies for the committee as well. Uh, let's go on, and I, that's all that I have. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, and I appreciate that. Um, as as we've talked about, you know, we're in the process of developing a strategic plan. That's one thing that 
that, that we've learned, we've heard from when we had the meeting last year uh, with the folks from Marseille, that having a, an intentional uh, plan really was, was the key. So uh, a, lot of all, a lot of this came out of an uh, innovation quarter opportunity study that was conducted last year. Um, and it, the key, one of the key conclusions was to accelerate the digital infrastructure connection. Um, and thanks to Go Virginia, both Regions 4 and Region 5, for funding this particular study. You can see, uh, you can get a copy of this study on our website if you'd like to take a look at it. So the planning process is underway. We've talked about this a little bit. We've, we've got a strategic process, you know, a year or so ago, we started with a core planning group. We got uh, Go Virginia funding. We created a steering committee this summer. We've had intentional reviews, uh, monthly meetings. Uh, we have, uh, we're right now in the stage that uh, both Jonathan and Janae are, are doing their, um, their studies. We're also going to get uh, input from concurrent studies that the Virginia Economic Development Partnership is doing and the Hampton Roads Alliance is doing on, on uh, data centers. Uh, so we're getting all these various insights uh, with the plan uh, to have two more meetings, one in December, one in January, and then our final meeting will be at the end of February with the hope at that point where we will have meshed together some type of a, of, of a plan. So this is one of the, the, uh, the groups, uh, one of our only uh, in-person meeting that we actually held back in uh, Williamsburg in uh, late August. You know, the, who's on the committee? So we, we've got uh, uh, committee members are, are, you know, we've got more than 60 committee members and they're from companies like Bank of America and CarMax and digital infrastructure firms like Meta uh, or, or the Pixel Factory. And we've got subsea cable owner operators. We've got broad brand firms, we've got cyber companies. There, and we've also got you know representative people from the utilities and uh, from planning organizations um, and the chambers and economic development entities. Um, we got uh, the strategic planning initiative received a hundred thousand dollar grant from Go Virginia, both Region Four, which is the Richmond area, and Region Five, which is Hampton Roads. We got additional funding from uh, these entities: Dominion Energy, Heracle County, Virginia Beach, the Hampton Roads Alliance. Old Dominion University and Dragonfly Group. Um, we created a, a project website to help not only committee members keep up with the project, but also to educate the public as well. So anybody can go onto this website, globalinternethub.org, to uh, see not only what we're doing, but also learn more about this process and learn more about the Global Internet Hub. Um, and I just want to just share with you: we've been we've had several stories written um, about. Uh, this the, uh, on the Global Internet Hub under media, you can check a look at some of these stories. Uh, one was the Times Dispatch did this um, infographic uh, in their insights section back in September. Um, you can see that if you like on the globalinternethub.org slash media. Uh, Inside Business, which is part of the Virginia Pilot, a newspaper, they've written a couple stories based on some of our previous uh, uh, digital uh, innovation spotlight uh, webinars that we've had. Here, Globex Magazine just released um, an article that we worked with them on that also not only shows you a timeline, which we've discussed a little bit, but also key quotes from different key leaders uh, in the mega region that are part of this uh, steering committee. You can also see that on the Global Internet website as well. Um, now it comes time for questions. We have a, a few moments uh, just to take a couple questions if anybody has any. Um, if, if you do, please uh, let me know. I actually, uh, I have a question for both Jonathan and, and uh, Vinay uh, briefly. So so tell me what, you know, what are, what, what are some of the benefits of having Deeks coming here to the Richmond market? Um, Jonathan or, or Vinay, you want to... To, yeah, I'll, I'll happily take that, Greg, and then uh, I apologize. I'll have to leave. I have to run another meeting at one o'clock. But DKIX is one of the leading data center neutral and carrier neutral internet exchanges in the world. So the neutral aspect is what's key, and also it's a distributed internet exchange. What that means is that once you're connected to it, whether you are currently in the QTS data center in Sandston, or you're at the Edge Connects data center, or you're at the Pixel Factory data center, you have access to all the networks that are interconnected at these three locations. 
uh, DKIX owns and manages the network connectivity between the three locations. So it's it's highly distributed and it's neutral. So that's the most important part. And they will expand to other, other facilities as well. And as that happens, you have the ability to connect to it from multiple locations. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, really re-emphasize re what you said about the, the, the them being so large and intermeshed globally. Um, they are a tremendous opportunity to on-ramp in, both into a local ecosystem and to peer into locations elsewhere, wherever your partners may be. So for the for the local market, it's a tremendous opportunity to get expedited access to peers, both locally and around the world. So we are running a little bit out of time, and I, I do uh, appreciate, uh, Vinay, I know you have a, a meeting to go to, uh, uh, but but thank you again for, for participating. Real briefly, let me just tell you what's happening uh, going forward, what's next. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you can get a recording, hear the recording of this, a short story on this on our website, which will be posted probably in about a week. Again, you can uh, find out more information by going to www.globalinternethub.org. I wanted to let you know about next month's meeting. And uh, starting in 2023, we are switching from having a meeting on Tuesdays, having these webinars on Tuesdays to the first Wednesday of every month. So next uh, month, it'll be Wednesday, January 4th. And we're going to be looking at the entrepreneurial ecosystem. You know, our mega region has so many different startup businesses, um, both in the Richmond and Hampton Roads markets, and it's they're, they're growing and thriving, but they also have challenges too. So we'll be talking about that. Um, it's Wednesday, January 4th um, at, from noon to four o'clock. Here's some ways you can help us, particularly if you uh, uh, want to follow us or have know of people that should be on our mailing list, please let us know. I would greatly appreciate it. Send me an email. Finally, I want to thank again to our sponsor, Colonial Web. Uh, it's great to have great sponsors. And again, thank you, Nathan, for that insightful introduction that you provided us. Uh, thank you, all everyone, for, for joining us. Uh, have a, a great holiday season, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year in 2023 on January 4th, 2023. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.